Epistle to the Ephesians. The first three chapters are really doctrinal. Very, very high level doctrine. Our position, what we are in Christ, and what he did. The last three chapters are our response to that doctrine, our duty, what we should do in response to that. It's interesting that Paul balances doctrine with duty. They're both essential. Duty without doctrine is empty, but doctrine without duty is empty, pointless. We inherit our wealth and faith, and we invest that wealth by works, okay? There is an interesting parallel I want to remind you of between Joshua and Ephesians. In Joshua, the people of Israel are entering into their possession of the land promised, their promised inheritance, if you will. In Ephesians, believers are called upon to enter by faith now in the possession of their promised inheritance. And I emphasize now, this is not something you inherit in eternity. You've got it right now. And that's one of the points they're going to try to make here. Alan Redpath has done a commentary on this called Victorious Christian Living. It's quite a, a classic because it really parallels Joshua and Ephesians. If I was doing a commentary, a written printed commentary on uh, Joshua, I'd put the parallel between Joshua and Revelation for some different reasons altogether. But uh, Alan Redpath's commentary is a classic. We're going to talk, we're going to encounter some really lofty topics. Our blessings in Christ, of course, but the concept of election, the concept of predestination, the concept of redemption, the concept of adoption. These are glib words we use occasionally, but they represent some heavy stuff. And of course, the will of God, the 12 kingdom mysteries, the concept of dispensations, the concept of forgiveness, what is it really? And the concept of inheritance. These concepts are uh, essential for us to really understand, and most people don't. And, of course, the concept of sealing, that we're actually sealed. What does that mean? These first four that we encountered last time, in reflecting on last time's lessons, it occurred to me that there's some background that I would like to throw into the picture here as we review where we stand so far. So I want to touch on something that those of you that are familiar with our materials are familiar with because we make this point in a number of our foundational materials. But it's so fundamental that I wanted to include just a little tutorial prologue before we go further in this epistle, the nature of time itself. You and I are the beneficiaries of a whole revolution in thinking, in physics, and in, in cosmology. It started by Einstein's theory, special theory of relativity in 1905, that things were all relative to one another, but that really led to a much more profound issue, and that's the theory of general rel relativity, as it's called, in 1915. And the basic insight that's critical for you and me, is that there's no distinction between time and space. Einstein come to real, came to realize that space is a four-dimensional property. There's three spatial dimensions that we're familiar with, length, width, height, and time, and uh, length, width, height, and, and, and uh, length, width, and height, and time. We live in a four-dimensional continuum, and his perceptions here have been confirmed more than 14 ways to 19 decimals. It's a well-established uh, discovery. But I want, to talk, I want us to grasp a little bit what it really means because it, it's, to stretch our understanding will make the entire Bible clearer and it'll evaporate many of the paradoxes that have plagued thinkers through the centuries. I want to talk about gravitational time dilation. You know, there are atomic clocks located in two locations. One is located at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado, what we used to call the Bureau of Standards. And the other one is located at the Royal Observatory in, London, in Greenwich, England. These atomic clocks are phenomenal devices. They're both equivalent to each other. They're both accurate to better than one second per million years. That's pretty precise. Hmm. Now, the point I'm getting at is, and we, you know, we know this because of its uh, atomic structure, but I won't get into all that here. The ones at Boulder, the clock at Boulder, click, uh, ticks five millionths of a second per year faster than the identical clock in Greenwich. So they're off five microseconds per year. That, that correction has to be adjusted. Which one's correct? They both are. They're both accurately measuring time. Time itself is different at those two locations. Why? Because Boulder, Colorado is at 5,400 feet above, uh, you know, virtually, you know, it's a mile above sea level. And Greenwich is 80 feet above sea level. 
And the difference in gravity causes, not the clocks to be wrong, for time to be different. That's the point. Atomic clocks. If I had one here on the platform and raise it by one meter, it would speed up by one, one part with 10 and 16 zeros after it. That's a very, very small amount, but it is predictable and measurable. There are other examples of this. They actually put aircraft around the world, going eastward and westward, and they gained and lost exactly what the theory predicted. But the one that's most interesting, uh, that any, text on any uh, textbook on the subject will include something the equivalent of this one. Two imaginary hypothetical astronauts, born at the same instant. We're going to send one of them on a trip to the nearest star. And if you look at the night sky, there is a star there called Alpha Centauri. It happens to be the one that's closest to us physically. And uh, we're going to send the one guy there, and, and it's, it's, the star is four and a half light years away. A light year is a measure of distance. How far can light travel in four and a half years? That's how far away it is. Well, if it's four and a half light years away, and we can, let's imagine we could send him at half the speed of light, then it would take him nine years to get there and nine years to get back. Right? With me? Okay. That's on our clock. He's left. In nine years, in, 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 four, in nine years, he'll get there because he's going half the speed of light. And nine, it'll take him nine years to get back. On our clock, it'll take 18 years. On, that's on, our, on his clock, however, there's a transformation called the Lorentz transformation that's applied here. It turns out he, when he returns, he'll be two years, five months younger than his twin brother. If that doesn't bother you, you are not listening carefully. They were both born at the same instant. The one that takes a trip and comes back is younger than his sibling. Let's put this another way. Let's imagine we could send that guy at almost the speed of light, say 99.99% of the speed of light. Again, it would take nine years round trip, four and a half there, four and a half back, essentially. And uh, if we apply the Lorentz transformations, of course, he gets back on his clock in 33 days. So we obviously hope that he bought some Microsoft stock before he left. But anyway, see, the point I'm going to get across is time is not uniform. Time is a physical property. Time varies, we know now, with mass, with acceleration, with gravity, among other things. Well, you and I exist in more than three dimensions. Actually, even more than four. Apparently ten, but I don't want to get in that here. We'll talk, be talking about that later when we get to chapter 3 of Ephesians. See, you and I tend to think that time is linear. When we were in school, the teacher wrote a, to put a line on the blackboard from left to right. The left end was the beginning of something, the birth of a famous person or the founding of an empire, or what have you. And the end of that on the right would be the end of that person or empire, or what have you. We make timelines. All of us have made timelines in school of some kind. Because of that background, we tend to jump to a conclusion that when we think of eternity, it's simply a line that starts at infinity on the left and goes to infinity on the right. We tend to think of God as someone who has lots of time, an unlimited amount of time. That makes good poetry, like our, our famous song of Amazing Grace dwells on the fourth verse and all that. Let me ask you some questions. Is God subject to the restrictions of mass? I don't think so. Is God subject to restrictions of acceleration or gravity? I don't think so. See, God is not somebody who has lots of time. He's someone outside the dimensionality of time altogether. And uh, this uniqueness is his personal imprint. It's so important for us to understand that because he demonstrates his messages by drawing upon that characteristic. That's what Isaiah means when he says, For thus saith that high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. If God has the technology to create us in the first place. He certainly has technology to get a message to us. The trick is, the challenge is, how does he authenticate it? How does he let us know that the message is really from him and not some kind of contrivance or a fraud? One way is to rely on something he alone can do, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. That's again Isaiah. Many examples I could draw. He writes history in advance. He uses that to demonstrate that he is, doesn't have lots of time. He's outside time altogether and can see the end from the beginning. Let me illustrate that another way. 
Imagine I take this line that I've put in front of you, and let's imagine I can have it stick out towards you. It's three, visualize this as being three-dimensional. You and I are in the dimensionality of time. Where we are at the moment, we call the present. Behind us is a memory we call the past. Ahead of us is a hope we call the future. We are in a timeline. It's like, for, for, for us, our life is sort of like a parade. We're sitting on the curb, and around the corner comes the first band, and the marching units, and the floats, whatever. For us, that parade is a sequence of events. Life for us is a sequence of events. But for someone who's outside the plane of that uh, uh, parade, um, if you're outside the, ex that, the existence of that parade's uh, existence, um, like say a helicopter above the parade, the helicopter can see the end from the beginning. It can see it, the first units, and it can see what's coming next, and it can look over there and see what's going to be coming in a few minutes, four minutes. You follow me? It can, because it's outside the plane of that parade. It's a clumsy example, but you get the idea. God's in eternity, and he can see the past, present, and future the same, at the same instant. My favorite quote of Einstein, and then we'll get back to the, what we're trying to, to study here, is that people like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between the past, the present, and the future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. I love that. Very, very eloquent. So, okay, we've got these topics that we're going to be dealing in. And, but these four, election, predestination, redemption, adoption, are ones that we won't be able to grasp unless we begin to realize they are within the time dimension. There are paradoxes that we encounter because we're viewing it from within the time domain. And uh, so I want to talk about divine volition here. We talked about that a little last time. It, we have these words that come up, foreknowledge, election, and predestination. Philosophers from the beginning of time have argued about fate versus free will. There are those that feel that everything's fated, that destiny is certain, and we don't have any real choice. And that everything's somehow predestined by fate or whatever. And there are others that argue we definitely have free will. We can choose and we can make mistakes and so forth. The tension between fate versus free will has been unresolved in the minds of philosophers for thousands of years. Because, and so, and it's, apparent, it's an apparent contradiction only because we're viewing it from within the time domain. When you step one step up outside the time domain, the problem goes away. Foreknowledge simply determines election. If I know what's going to happen, it helps me pick the one that it's going to happen to. Right? Election, predestination brings to pass the election. In other words, I know it's going to happen, so I elect, and because I elect, that's predestined. That all makes sense if you're watching it from outside time. Election looks back to foreknowledge, and predestination looks forward to destiny. These are simply subsets of the bridge between being in the time domain and being outside in eternity. It's that simple. I hope that's helpful. And... Uh, I think it'll help deal with a whole bunch of issues we're going to get into. So let's review quickly what we've covered so far last time, just lightly. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from our God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. God, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. That's the only way you want to be one, right? By the will of God. He didn't choose it, neither did the church. And this, this is going to bring us face to face with the sovereignty of God and the mystery of His will. We're going to see that six times in this epistle. Saints, I don't think anyone here is confused about that. that that's not used the way the churches typically use it. It simply means set apart. It's not a sinless person, simply a saved sinner. And uh, we talked about that last time. Which are at Ephesus. Now that phrase is not in some of the oldest manuscripts, which seems to underscore the fact that this letter, while written maybe to Ephesus, at the same time was regarded as an encyclical. That is, that all the epistles were circulated among all the churches. They had treasured them so highly, they all wanted their copies. But uh, so, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's, that's emphasized here. To the faithful in Christ Jesus. We're going to discover that term, in Christ Jesus, means far more than we begin to suspect until we've studied it carefully. It's used 27 times in this letter. 
And uh, it's interesting that he always emphasized uh, the, the, the title of Christ first, Christ Jesus. T Christ is not his last name, it's his title, okay? And uh, so we're a member of the body of Christ, vitally uh, united with him. Grace be unto you and peace. We have these two phrases, one from the, the Greek greeting of charis, hello, and it's 12 times in this epistle. It's always first, you have grace before you have peace. And, uh, and peace, shalom, which is the Jewish greeting. So you got a, a Gentile and, a, and, and a, 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 a Jewish combination here. And Paul always uses them together that way. And uh, to our God, our Father. Interesting situation. He is our Father. Applies intimacy. Very important. And I, I want to touch just on this because it comes up so often. That's his title, his name, and his mission. And he lifts his voice in the magnet. It's a hymn of praise. And it goes higher than... All the way, from verses 3 to 14, we're going to trace God's activity from salvation and eternity past through time to eternity future. And it's all going to be a, a fabric that it's drawn against is the mystery of God's will. And that will was not disclosed before. This epistle is going to reveal it for the first time in the entire Bible, in chapter 3. That's the, the big deal there. We'll get there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. The word place has been added by the translators. It's the blessings, of course, are in contrary to what's earthly. It's earth, heavenly blessings. In heavenly places. The word places has been added. It's more accurate to leave that out, by the way, for a number of reasons. And in Christ, of course, 27 times, and we've talked about that. According as he hath chosen us in him, when... When did God first start thinking about you before the foundation of the world? Staggering. When he started thinking about you, he chose you before the world was created. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And I love Spurgeon's quip here. He says, I'm glad he chose me back then. If he saw me now, I might change his mind. <laughs> so, all right. Election. You have not he says, you, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. See, the lost sinner left his own ways will not seek God. The seeking is also at God's initiative. God in his love seeks the sinner. And election is a bona fide offer to everyone. That shows, we're going to try to show you uh, before it's all over that the doctrine of Calvinism, of limited atonement, is unscriptural, unfortunately. I mean, it's, it's, fortunately it is, but I mean, unfortunately for them, that's something that's easily disproved of the five points of Calvinism, that's the most vulnerable one. Offer is, bona, is it bona fide to everyone. The lost choose to be lost. And there's plenty of verses on that. And uh, all that are given come, and all that come are received. That's summarized in John 6. God does choose men to salvation. Believers are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. First Peter hammers that. People can know. You say, gee, have I been elected or not? Easy to find out. You can know whether you're elected by your response to the gospel. Those that hear and believe are the elect. It's that simple. It's not a trick twisting. It's actual. That's the fundamental. And his purpose in you will not be completely realized until we're with him in heaven. And that's the other big crescendo that's coming in this epistle. Israel was chosen, of course, a lot of verses on that, through Abraham. Not for any merit they had. Ezekiel 36 will hammer that. It's entering election in both the Old Testament and the New Testament in the Hebrew and the Greek. The word elect, election, choose, chosen. Basically the same words. To choose. Both divine and human choices, the same term is used. And, I, and that's where I, I like this paradigm that the foreknowledge determines the election and then the which determines the predestination, and, and uh, that brings it back to a destiny, if you will. Election looks back, predestination looks forward. But that's the sequence. And it'll show up again and again in many forms. And if you want the, real, the hammered one with the five unbreakable links, all you have to do is read Romans chapter 8 from verse 29 to the end of that verse, uh, chapter. Romans 8. Election. There's a corporate election. Israel and the church are both corporate electors, if you will. There's individual elections according to foreknowledge, 1 Peter 1, 2. It's entirely of grace. He didn't pick you because you're a neat guy or gal. He just did because he did. 
He loved, he loves you. Totally of grace, not of any merit. And that's why some of them, some are chosen for himself. Either for himself or also for chosen, the other concept of cho chosen is for distinctive service. He may have chosen you for a particular mission. And uh, you thought you volunteered. No, no, he chose you. <laughs> Having predestinated us to, unto the adoption of children. There's another concept that we probably only partially understand. By Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Having predestinated us. Parisos. To define, to make out, to set apart. Technically it means to horizon. And uh, having predestinated, that's in the Greek, an aorist, definite past act. It's done deal. This term is only used referring to God's purposes for his people. Predestination has to do with God's purpose with his people. It refers, refers only to those that are saved. Election is the people of God. Predestination is the purposes of God. And having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, the adoption, here we are, Placing as a son. Placing as a son. And in the Roman household, you had sons that were maybe not born in the household, they were adopted. You've seen the novel Ben-Hur, it hangs on that kind of a concept in the, in the Roman scheme of things. Predestination is God's guarantee. And John 10 hammers that home. We need to know that we've been chosen in order to stand for God today. In order to stand for Him today. It's a Roman, not a Jewish practice. Not all offspring were heirs. You could be born in the household and not adopted. That may shock you. You do not get in God's family by adoption. You get into his family by the new birth. At the same time, that's step one. Adoption is the act of God by which he gives us, he gives his born ones adult standing in the family. So it can be, immediately be able to claim our inheritance and enjoy our spiritual wealth. An infant can't use his inheritance until he gets to, until he's a, he gets to, uh, adopts. An adult son can and should. And we're, the future aspect of adoption is also in Romans 8, in the earlier part of that, that chapter. Very key chapter, Romans 8. We get our nature as a son of God in, by the Holy Spirit in regeneration. That's why it's called born again, because we're a new creature's, uh, a, new, a new created thing is created. In adoption, we receive the position of a son. One is our nature, and the other one is our position as a son. And we get that the moment we believe. The full manifestation of a sonship await the resurrection, the change, translation of saints. The full manifestation will occur at the rapture, or at, at, at the redemption of the body. Plenty of verses on that. See, there's no procedure to become unadopted, by the way. It's another form of security. So the Christian rests completely on his completed work. The greatest mistake that any Christian can do is to substitute your will for his will. Big mistake. We do it all the time, but it's always a mistake. We need to repent of it and deal with it. And why did he save us in the first place? For his good pleasure. And he will not be satisfied until he surrounded himself with sons conformed to the image of his only begotten son with him and like him forever. That's that we're going to see that climax build up. Okay, that's a clumsy summary of where we've been. Let's take a look, see how far we can get in the in, in this session here. Verse six to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So the God looks at us and sees his son. That's what he's talking about. To the praise of the glory of his grace. This will occur three times in this section. What are the terms? He freely bestowed it on us in the Beloved. In the Beloved. How much does the Father love the Son? Wow. That's how much He loves us. Has made us accepted in the Beloved. Israel was chosen to live, in, to, to, live to His praise, and we also. You can find that in both the Old, in the New Testament as well as the Old. If he gave his son for me, then he must love me as greatly as he loves his son, or he would never have permitted him to die for me. So think about that logic yourself. That's exactly that, that is just amplified in the prayer that we have transcripted for us in John 17. That's the Lord's prayer, the prayer to his Father. The whole chapter, one of the most breathtaking 
um, studies in the Gospel of John, which of course is in many respects the high ground of the four Gospels. The other par parallel here is the little epistle to Philemon. And um, if Onesimus, this runaway slave, owes you anything, Onesimus, put it on my account. Paul is acting out and acting as the exemplar of um, intercession. Paul is saying to Philemon, you owe me your life. But anyway, whatever, Onesimus, if he owes you anything, put it on my account. And uh, impressive little letter. Anyway, in whom we have a de redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Here's another word that we throw around a lot. We need to look at very carefully. What is God's greatest work? Is creation? Man. The creation of the universe? That's the more you, especially in astronomy on the one hand or particle physics on the other, you're confronted with the frontiers of science with awe that God created the creation. Well, how, uh, uh, how important is it biblically? Well, you've got a few chapters in Genesis. You've got a couple of chapters in Isaiah. A couple of chapters perhaps in Job. That's about it. Scattered verse here and there. What about the redemption? Well, how much space of the Bible is dealt to that, with that? The whole book of Genesis. Exodus. All redemption. The whole Torah. The prophets. The New Testament. All about the redemption. The whole Bible is. So you'd, there's another way to look at it. You, you can look at it by the portion of Scripture that's devoted to it. There's another way to look at it. What did it cost him? God creation, he called it into existence. I suspect he could do it again. In fact, he's going to do it again. He's going to recreate it when he's ready. What did the redemption cost him? His son. No, the redemption. Heavy term. Heavy term. Old Testament background. We have, of course, the redemption of the lands exemplified in Leviticus and Numbers and so on. The nation itself was redeemed from slavery, the whole book of Exodus. That's another form of redemption. And, of course, the key to that is Deuteronomy 7 and so on. The Passover sacrifice is interesting because it's distinct from the sin offerings. See, all the Levitical offerings are done by the priest. The Passover is done by the head of the family. But it's an individual, not a high priest, not in its original form. All these point to Christ, of course. That's why John the Baptist can introduce him publicly. Behold the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. He gives him a Passover title, in effect. The Lamb of God. And he's referring to the Passover, of course. There are three words for redemption in the New Testament. Agorazo, to purchase. Exagorazo, which is to buy, to purchase, but buy out of the market, never to sell them again, to take it out of the market, so to speak, for one's own use, for, for an example. Not to resell, in other words, is the, is the Greek concept. So those are two, two words that occur elsewhere. Here, the word is apolitosis, which is to be loosed away from something, to rescue by ransom, in effect, what's implied here. So there's three different words. The one here is to rescue by ransom. Our ransom was paid by his blood, is what the concept here is. There were six million slaves in the Roman Empire, bought and sold like chattel. You could purchase a slave and then set him free if you felt like it. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He purchased us and turned us free. Wow. Through his blood, Peter reminds us, no less a price would do. And that's what the epistle of the Hebrews hammers through. Our lives were forfeit due to sin. So the role of Christ's blood cannot be overemphasized. That's what, the, that's what it took to free us. We got a summary of this in, in uh, Hebrews 10. But we also see another summary of it, one of my favorites, in Colossians 2.14. The handwriting of the ordinance is our certificate of death was paid, stamped, paid in full. When you served your sentence in a prison, you finally served it, they would write on it to tell us die, paid in full. And they'd give you a copy of your death certificate to, to, to prevent any double jeopardy. 
Once you were free, you were free. They couldn't try you for that same crime again. That's where the, de- that's where the concept of double jeopardy comes in. Well, Jesus Christ on the cross in John 19, verse 30, it's translated, it is finished. The Greek word he yelled was to telestai, and that means paid in full. Now, by the way, we're talking about an uh, uh, infinite atonement. It is not limited. His offer of redemption is legitimate for everyone. 1 John 2, verse 1 and 2 are your proof of that. And uh, there's another phrase that Peter uses of the, of the Lord's death, 2 Peter 2, 1. It's a very valuable verse. It speaks of those that denied the Lord that bought them. The people he's talking about are not saved because they denied the Lord. But the Lord's purchase by Peter, Peter designates applies to them if they would accept it. This shatters the concept of limited atonement. Christ died for everyone. We're all included in that purchase. Everyone, saved and unsaved. The difference is the saved people have accepted it, received it. The unsaved have denied it and rejected it. Big mistake. Continuing, in whom we have redemption uh, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. There's this word forgiveness. What does it really mean? It's the fruit of redemption. There are three aspects to forgiveness. There's the governmental forgiveness that has temporal consequences. You don't have to go to jail, so to speak. There's eternal forgiveness, and that's what's being used here because you're both past, present, and future forgiven. And there's also the restorative forgiveness, 1 John 1, 9, the Christian's bar of soap. If we confess our sins, He is just and, and, uh, and will uh, cleanse us, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9, fabulous, fabulous verse. According to the riches of His grace. The word riches occurs six times in this letter. Paul can't seem to find a higher way of expressing that. And how is it measured? According to the riches of His grace. How is that measured? It's not merely out of all what you might need. It goes far beyond that. It's the equivalent of a blank check, actually. His grace. Let's remind ourselves from our study of Romans what the word grace means. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's biggest problem, his frustration is he wanted to forgive you. He wanted you to be, he wanted to be intimate with you. But he can't violate his justice. He's got a problem. He wants to receive you, but he can't do so uh, unless your deficiencies are paid for. And that's what Christ did. Christ followed, uh, Christ uh, resolved or solved God's biggest problem. Not only your problem, my problem, God's biggest problem. Because he, because he died, God is now able to justify you without clouding his righteousness. God's riches at Christ's expense. We call it grace. Interesting. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. In his grace, he chose us, he predestinated us, and redeemed us. But that's not all. It goes more than that. He superabounded us, is what the Greek says, in all wisdom, Sophia, knowledge that sees into the heart of things. That's real knowledge. Which, you know, the knowledge that knows them as they really are. Boy, how we covet that. And prudence. What is prudence? The understanding that leads to right action. Pernesis. Pernesis is understanding that leads to right action. Okay. The will of God. Boy, that's an easy phrase. What on earth is that all about? God shares his plans and purposes with us for the church and for the universe. The great goal toward which all history is moving. And we're going to see that before the chapter closes. We're going to see it many places. But it's, the chapter is going to close before it nails what's really, where is this all headed? What's really going on here? You know, you read all kinds of books that talk about the various dynamics in, in, in history. The psychological dynamics, the sociological. If you study, take a course in political science, they have all their various theories. No, there's only one dynamic, and that's the will of God. 
That's where history is going, whether it understands it or not. It's interesting that even the angels learn about the will of God by watching us. It's not like they get a chalk talk up in heaven and here's how it's going to happen. No, they learn by watching it unfold in us. 1 Peter 1.12 highlights that. Can you get that image that they're, they're watching with great fascination about what God is doing by watching what he does through us? You know, as a businessman, one of the things you quickly learn, whether it's in business or whether it's in military strategy, the most valuable kind of information is perspective. If you have a valid perspective, you can, fill in, you can, you can inquire and fill in the details. The, the precious thing is to have a legitimate, a, a, a correct perspective. That's the extent. So you and I are going to be sanctified through this truth. Christ has given us the ability to see the great ultimate truths of eternity and thus to properly deal with the challenge of each moment in time. You and I can handle moment by moment things if and only if we really understand the ultimate truths of eternity. That's one reason why increasingly in our materials we're going to try to develop what I call a kingdom perspective. It's astonishing how many people have spent their entire life uh, in Bible study and, and in churches and what have you, and yet, for whatever reasons, have never embraced or understood the kingdom What's it, that's coming. We call them, you know, we say, thy kingdom come, and when we pray, what kingdom are we talking about? It's astonishing to discover how few people really have a kingdom perspective. We're going to pursue that as we go forward. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. The mystery of his will. Mysterion. In the Greek, the word mysterion is a sacred secret previously unknown, but here revealed. It isn't just a label for something that's enigmatic, the way we use the term in English. It really is the occasion where something very special is being unveiled. The mysterion of his will. And uh, what is the mystery of his will? That, that's, the, the, that's the dominant theme of this epistle. The mystery of his will. There are all kinds of mysteries, by the way. There's 12 of them. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 13 deals with that. The mystery of iniquity is something Paul alludes to in 2 Thessalonians. The mystery of Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18. There's an aspect of that. There's a very, it isn't just a, an evil city. There's something much deeper Mystery behind it. The mystery of the church as one body. That's the mystery that's going to be revealed here in Ephesians chapter 3 when we get there. The mystery of the bride of Christ. Something that still eludes us in really understanding what that means. Of the in living, living in Christ, being in Christ. This is going to come up again and again. The fullness of the Godhead is alluded to. The mystery of godliness, 1 Timothy 3.16. The mystery of the rapture. It's amazing how many Christians are still fuzzy on that whole issue. The mystery of Israel's present blindness, Paul talks about. The mystery of the will of God, of course, the whole epistle of Ephesians is all about. And the mystery of the seven stars in Revelation 1 is specifically designated. So we've got 12 of them. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Death verse here. Oh boy, the dispensation of the fullness of time. The word dispensation itself will evoke controversy in many quarters. But it's a word that's clearly used in the scripture. Oikonomia. Dispensation. What does it mean? It's the administration of something, a household or a company or a government thing. It's a stewardship or an economy. A set of conditions and rules and what have you. It's the dispensation. How are you dealing with that? It's the ordered condition of things. It can be used many different ways. Dispensation. Dispensation is in the fullest of times. Now the word times here is not the word chronos. That's the passage of days, months, and years. It's times in a different Greek word here, kairos. Particular times, decisive segments of time. What the, the concept here, the dispensation of the fullness of times, is that ultimately our times from, through history are sequential. They're, they're distinctives. They're differences. There's nothing 
uh, heretical about that. There are many people that get very uncomfortable with that. That's what the Scripture talks about. In fact, Paul admonishes Timothy, second letter. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing, segmenting, if you will, the word of truth. That's what he talks about, rightly dividing the word of truth. And it's the same word, okonomia, the ordered conditions of things. Christ himself was a dispensationalist, by the way. In Luke chapter 4, he, in, in Nazareth, he reads from Isaiah. And when you compare what he read from Luke 4 with the passage that he was reading from in Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 1 and 2, you discover something interesting. He pauses and closes his, at a comma. He doesn't finish the phrase there. He pauses at where we, where we have a comma. And then he closes the book and says, these things are fulfilled in your eyes. If you read what's beyond the comma, there's something that's coming that hasn't happened yet. The day of vengeance of our God is the part he did not read. The point being, he stopped at the comma, and this part's been fulfilled. The other hasn't. He's being a dispensationist. That dispensation is here, guys. It's me. The part that isn't here yet will be not yet. Now, with the classical profile of these, there are several. Larkin has one. Scoville is probably the most well-known one. He calls the age of innocence, that's, you know, from the beginning, and it ends at the fall of man, his innocence. That ushers in an area that some people call conscience or moral responsibility. From the fall of man, when God uh, instructs him there in Genesis 3, it concludes at the flood, because then we get into a broader sense after the flood of Noah, where those eight people then reestablish the population of the earth. Some people call it the, the dispensation of human government. Starting at Genesis 8, verse 15, when does it end? At Babel, because there's something else. At, at, at Babel, we have the promise, because Babel occurs at 11. Chapter 12, as Abraham's called, that ushers in the age of the promise in, in the minds of many, from Genesis 12 on. When does it end? At the bondage in Egypt. Because they go in as a family, come out as a nation. And when they come out as a nation, they get the law under Moses. That, start from, that starts at Exodus 19. When does it end? At the captivity in Babylon. Interestingly enough. Now, we have, of course, then the church is this strange parenthesis that, uh, unfortunately, on many charts and things, that's called the age of grace. And that's unfortunate because what the critic will quickly point out is all of these involve grace. So don't call the, the, the sixth one the age of grace. It is the age of grace, but they all are in that fact. That's why calling it the church age is perhaps you know, more descriptive. And it doesn't end until the world will ultimately worship the Antichrist, and Christ will in, in, interrupt it with his return. Okay? In fact, the, 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 this is the Schofield model. I would make it slightly different, but that's just... Uh, uh, let's see, the last one here is the kingdom. And that's uh, what Revelation 20 is about. It actually is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. There's another way to model this in that sense. And of course, the kingdom will end with Satan's rebellion when it's put down, and then we end the eternal state. So this is one way to draw it. Now, there are people that would argue that the fifth one here, the age of the law, it ends actually with John the Baptist. Because Jesus calls it that. The law and the prophets were until John. And so that's a, perhaps a better way to describe its, its ending, if you will. And uh, the church is born in Acts chapter 2, and it ends at the Harpazo, the rapture. There is a segment between the rapture and the kingdom where the law is continued, if you will, called the Great Tribulation. So there's different ways to model this, and I didn't want to make a big thing of it here because we're really... Just to show you, there's other... Bullinger is also one of the classical uh, dispensational guys, and he breaks these down slightly differently. The innocence, ignorance, the law, grace, judgment, and millennium, and then the eternal state. And uh, that's different than most of them. I only put it in here to give you, let you realize that different authorities have slightly different ways of reckoning the segmentation here. That in the dispensation of the fullest time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Gather together. Believe it or not, that's the Greek word that's there. What is it? There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's a 17 letter word. I suppose Mary Poppins could really make something of that. I won't even try to pronounce it, or I won't even try to mispronounce it. 
But what does it really mean? It's a term in the Greek, by the way, that means to sum up and unite, but it also points to the peculiar way that they summed. They would always have a practice of putting the, of adding a column of figures and putting the sum of them at the top. It's putting the sum on the top of things. So it's an interesting word from that point of view. It's the sum at the top. That he might gather us together, but put it all at the top. See? And uh, in one, all things in Christ, absolute universality, in heaven and on earth. And that's going to be hammered away in this epistle. See, that's today's heresy today. It may surprise you. You know one of the heresies we indulge in today, all of us do? Dividing life into the sacred and secular. You know? Christ is concerned with all things. All things find their true place and unity in Him. Now, I'm not suggesting, I'm not getting to the church and state issue before our laws. It's a little different kind of a thing. Still, from our personal life's concern, we shouldn't designate things as secular. All things, if we're in Christ, are, 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 are relevant. Head up all things in Christ, the Scripture says. Anyway, moving on. Uh, in whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Inheritance. There's another word that we misunderstand. Clairou is the root word. It actually originally meant to cast lots or determine by lot. From that it really comes to mean to allot or allocate uh, like to somebody else for a possession. In the New Testament, that term is used as a, uh, a heritage or private possession. It takes its form as kleronomia, which is the, uh, uh, an inheritance, property received or to be received as an inheritance. It's what's given to one as a possession. That's what the word inheritance means. Don't confuse that with your salvation, or to be more precise, your justification. The fact that you're justified cannot be taken away from you. That would be double jeopardy. If you've been declared not guilty because of the completed work of Christ, praise God for that. You are then eligible for an inheritance if on certain conditions. Let's understand that most Christians don't. Inheritance. There are two kinds of inheritance. There's inheritance by birth. When you're born again, you are a son. That's unconditional and automatic. Best example is the prodigal son. Even after all his misdeeds and blowing his inheritance, he never lost his sonship. Luke 15. Great lesson. There's another part of inheritance that you can lose. Inheritance that requires faithful obedience. And the, the uh, scripture is full of those examples. We'll talk a little bit more on the next slide here. This form of inheritance is conditional upon faithfulness, obedience, and perseverance. This is an inheritance that you're scheduled for if you don't blow it. What's the net of all this? Behavior matters. And your inheritance can be lost. In the Old Testament, inheritance, inheritance can be lost. That's what Deuteronomy 6 and 19 deals with. You want to talk about inheritance lost? Talk to Esau. Genesis 27, and that's hammered away in Hebrews uh, 12. Ask Reuben. He was the firstborn, but he blew it by messing around with his father's concubines. So he lost his firstborn status. That was, something, that was an inheritance he lost. Here's, the main one, here's one that may surprise you. Do you know who else failed to get his inheritance? Moses. When he struck the rock the second time was a big mistake. And he, and he, and he so claims. So they lost an inheritance. Did he lose everything? No, but he did lose the, uh, his ability to enter the promised land. His dream was denied him. In the New Testament, your inheritance can be lost. And that's all through the New Testament, but the book of Hebrews, that's its primary burden. Many people misunderstand the book because they don't understand that it's written to Jewish believers, people who are saved. And uh, chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, and, and on and on and on. Um, 
it's, uh, it can be lost. And that's exactly what the judgment seat of Christ is dealing with. And, and uh, it's in, first, in 2 Corinthians 5.10 is where it's declared. 1 Corinthians 3 is the procedure. Your salvation, the salvation of the, the person there is not the issue. It's his rewards for faithfulness. Some may be zero, and some may, very be, some may be substantial. There's five crowns detailed. There's a number of other things. And that's uh, uh, what Revelation 2 and 3 uh, deal with. In whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of God, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Predestinated again. Here we go again with... Parizo. It includes the salvation of the elect and also all other acts and events in the universe, both good and evil. Acts 4, especially in the Greek, emphasize that. There are two classes of divine will. Divinely caused, where God sees to, He caused it to happen, and those which He permits. There is evil permitted by Satan that God ha he does it because God has allowed it. When Satan works Job over, it's because God gave him permission to go so far and not any further. It's interesting to know that if you're in Christ, everything that happens to you is Father-filtered. Yes, he may cause some things in your life for your own growth, for your own chastisement, whatever. He permits that. And uh, it's, it's refreshing to know it's Father-filtered. That we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ. You know, it's interesting, only a small remnant of Jews respond to the gospel in the early days of Christianity. We read about it, and there's some thousands, but still it will be different at the second coming. Zechariah 12 and Romans 11 point out that it's going to be a big deal, and quite different than we're used to. Verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Whoa! Here's another one of these concepts that we need to really embrace and understand. Sealed. See, the entire process of salvation is given here in this verse, by the way. Okay? But you've got to do something here. There's a mistake the way it's translated. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard. The word after, the, it, is, it is not a time clause. It's a genitive absolute. All in the same tense as the main verb. The aorist tense, it's once and for all. Correcting that. The Shreedi should say, in whom also you, upon hearing, and it's errorist, the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, in whom also on believing, again, errorist tense, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The entire process of salvation there at that instant. What are the steps? They heard, they believed, they were sealed. This is a, a very powerful Example of security. They were sealed. What were they sealed with? The Holy Spirit Himself. They were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Wow. Let's uh, talk about that a bit. The Holy Spirit of promise. He was promised by the Father back in Joel 2 and emphasized in Acts 1 even. He was promised by the Lord Jesus in John 16, just before the famous John 17 chapter. And... Uh, there are, by the way, something else to be aware of. There are many mentions of the Trinity in, this, in the letter to Ephesians. God the Father in verse 3, God the Son in verse 7, and God the Holy Spirit here in this verse. That's another way. I, I didn't want to disrupt the organization of the epistle by hammering that too hard, simply to call your attention to it. But you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The word sealed occurs in four times in the New Testament. What does the word sealing really mean? What does that term mean? Well, it's a completed transaction. In Jeremiah 32, we have a model of that, where a deed is sealed for the future, because he's buying some property. His descendants will come and claim it after the Babylonian captivity, after 70 years, whatever. But, um, and of course, John 17, it's used of us in his prayer to the Father. 
meaning a complete transaction. And the same concept is evident in Colossians 2.14, where he says to tell us die on our certificate of debt. Or, as, as, and, uh, sealing also is used to uh, highlight ownership. That again, the model is Jeremiah 32, and Paul uses the same term in 2 Timothy 2. Sealing also is for security. In the book of Esther, it's used in that sense. In fact, Pilate does the same thing. He seals the tomb in Daniel, uh, excuse me, uh, I'm mixing two different stories. He did seal the tomb, and that was also a Pilate putting his security on the tomb. But the one I uh, had in mind here when I'm putting the notes together was the, the lion's den, where it was sealed by the king to, to, to give it security. And there's other places where something's sealed to demonstrate its authenticity, Romans 8, verses 9. Sealing guarantees our preservation, and that's going to be hammered for us in Ephesians chapter 4. And we, by being sealed by the Holy Spirit, we're being branded as His property. And 1 Corinthians 6 deals with that. We're sealed. Nothing temporary or vulnerable about that movement. In fact, which is the earnest of our inheritance, like the down payment to seal the bargain, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of our purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. The earnest of our inheritance. The word is araban, down payment. What does it do? It pledges the full amount will be paid. I'll give you a down payment as my proof that you're going to get all your money. The term comes from the Phoenician traders. It's also used of the bridegroom's betrothal gifts to the bride. Now, something else that occurs through this is that pronouns are merged from the we in verse 11 and 12 to the ye in verse 13 to the our, all of us together, in verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance, yours and mine. So it's not us and them here, we're all together. And that's starting to echo, set the stage for what's going to, cut, what's going to hit us in chapter 3. And uh, the, because what, what's going to be revealed here in this letter for the first time is the emergence of a totally new organism, the ecclesia, the church in its mystical sense, not in its, not in its local sense, in its mystical sense. A whole new thing. And... Uh, Obviously, that's going to, we'll hit that when we get there. Now, something else about verse 14 that's not clear in the English translation. This verse ends a sentence that began in verse 3. We have had a sentence here that went on for 11 verses, concatenating concepts here. So that's Paul. So, the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of purchase possession of the praise of his glory. That sweeps God's program from eternity past through our present to eternity future. And I'm going to suggest to you that these 14 verses occupy the most awe-inspiring thoughts that can occupy the human mind. And it's very tempting to try to take it, and you can make a career of just expositing all the background of all the terms and all the applications in this uh, in, in just this first chapter. And uh, so, we're going to try to strike a balance of at least doing it some justice, but just with the caveat that you can, you, uh, we're, we're literally just skipping across the surface. Each one of these things are very, very, uh, are concepts that have very, very deep roots, if you will. Seal, the guarantee that we ourselves will be kept safely for the inheritance. Earnest that the inheritance will be kept securely for us. So it's two sides to that. And, and three times he reminds us that the intended goal and the result that's inevitable is that God will be magnified and glorified. To the praise of the glory of His grace, verse 6. That we should be the praise of His glory, verse 12. Unto the praise of His glory here in verse 14. That's the climax, and that climax is going to be nailed for us before this chapter ends, but that be next time. So for the next session, I'd like you to read the entire epistle, only six chapters, 
Read it through before next time. Study chapter 1 all the way through, but focus especially on the part, the remainder that we haven't dealt with yet, 15 to 23. It's not as, uh, it doesn't have as many potholes as the first uh, 14 verses have, but it's, uh, I, I'm a, I think we can wrap up chapter 1 in the next session. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.